thank you yeah, very much for having me. So my paper is, uh, is about that, multidimensional diplomacy. So one thing that I think is uh, uncontroversial is that international negotiations are often very complex. In uh, Yalta, uh, there was a complex negotiation. Russia wanted things like Poland shifted over a little bit, and it was offering to perhaps join the war with Japan. And uh, there was a question about whether there was going to be a, uh, some sort of uh, United Nations or something like that. And uh, Russia said, uh, OK, uh, but I'm going to need some concessions. I'm going to need veto power. So there are a number of issues that they were negotiating on at the same time. In World War I, uh, when, uh, when Wilson uh, arrived there in Paris uh, after World War I, there were 217 members of the British uh, delegation who had already arrived to negotiate things over there. So uh, enormously complex. And today we have, uh, we have similar uh, complexity in the issues that are confronted. In a particular, in crisis bargaining situations, in, uh, in 1914, Austria made 10 demands uh, of Serbia. The Serbians effectively uh, accepted all but one of them, uh, and we still had a war. Uh, in 1812, the US government uh, made two demands on the British. Uh, one uh, of those uh, demands was uh, conceded by the British. Unfortunately, uh, the British uh, conceded it before the Madison administration declared war, uh, but they uh, declared war before the boat carrying the news that the British had con made the concession arrived uh, in the New World. But anyway, even after the Madison administration learned that in fact uh, the British had made a major concession, they still went to war. In the Cuban Missile Crisis, there are uh, three principal issues, whether or not uh, the U.S. was going to offer a non-invasion pledge of Cuba, the Jupiter missiles in Turkey, and of course whether the missiles were going to be uh, removed from, from Cuba. Uh, Bush had arguably two demands uh, in Afghanistan in 2001, so uh, hand over bin Laden and also uh, dismantle the terrorist training camps. Uh, so uh, in many, many, many international crises and other international contexts, there are multiple issues states are, are talking about. And as I'll say, I'll come back to at the end, when even when a single demand is made, there may be other issues in the background. And so the fact that a single demand is made may be an endogenous result. And what I'm going to argue to you is that when in these contexts, when there are multiple separate issues around, uh, the crisis bargaining looks very, very different than it does in uh, other contexts where that's not the case. Okay, so uh, for those of you, I know many of you are economists, so uh, this is some literature in political science about uh, how uh, diplomats communicate to each other. And this is what I'm going to be uh, discussing today. So uh, according to Firon and, and, and other people really, uh, in the economics literature, there are incentives to overstate resolve in a crisis bargaining context. You want to convince the other side that, hey, I'm going to go to war with you unless you give me what I want even if you might not be willing to do it. And so therefore, it's hard for the other side to learn things from the things that you say. So how does the, the other side learn things from the things that you say? Well, there's a number of, uh, a number of different mechanisms that are, have been proposed. Some have been formalized. Some haven't been formalized. The reputation mechanism is one that's very well known. That is, uh, you have a bargaining reputation to maintain. You wouldn't want to get caught in the bluff. So when you pound the table and you say, I really will do it, it uh, is thought to convey some and there's a number of other uh, mechanisms I'll just point you to for now and say that are in the literature, but I'm going to talk about a mechanism that hasn't been discussed before. So as I say, all of these models really look at negotiation on a single dimension. So the question, one way of putting the question of this paper, or one of the questions of it, is is this single dimension, that is, what I mean by that is just a single issue, uh, is that a simplification without consequences? And the answer is no. It is not a simplification without consequences. And when we have uh, additional complexity to the, issue, the issues being negotiated over, uh, we can have communication in uh, many, many cases when we would not have been able to have it in a single, when only a single issue is being negotiated over. And also, uh, we have some 
surprising comparative statics in this case. So a decrease in the probability uh, that the target would fight for one of the issues can actually increase the probability of war because of the mediating effect of, the, uh, of, the, of communication on the probability of conflict. All right, some more literature review. There's, um, there's a big, big literature on issue linkage. I haven't tried to cite all the papers or even anything like a, a, a sampling, really, a representative sampling. Uh, but there's a lot of papers that say, well, when two issues are linked, then maybe that can uh, expand, uh, expand the bargaining space. Uh, but in the international political context, Morrow argues that uh, we really don't see issue linkage that much. I don't think he's really right about that. He may be right that we don't see it as much as some of those theories would expect that we would see it. But we certainly do see it quite a lot. Uh, but he says, we don't, the reason why we don't see it is because when one side comes and says, hey, I'll link these two issues, then it's maybe admitting weakness. And it doesn't want to do that. And so it's always a bad idea to come and link issues. And therefore, we won't see that happening. And uh, the model that I'm going to show you doesn't have that flavor. And we can talk about why it doesn't have that flavor. But uh, it shows that, at the very least, that's not a general result. And then uh, there's a literature which is much on contributing directly to on um, cheap talk signaling, which began with a seminal paper by Crawford and Sobel in 1982. Uh, there have been a number of other, there have been a lot of other papers that have really used uh, very much that framework, but there have been a couple of other papers, more than a couple, probably I think about five or six, but I've cited two of them, uh, that uh, have also thought about what would happen if you expanded uh, the dimensionality of the issue space. So Battaglini, uh, 2002, says, well, what if you have um, if you have uh, multiple dimensions and you also have multiple sources of information. And it shows that then you can have a lot more information revelation than you could in the original Crawford Sobel single dimensional context. Uh, the, uh, the closest paper uh, to what I'm going to talk about is uh, Chakra, well, uh, Harbo and Chakra Borti. We'll, uh, we'll hope that's an approximation. Uh, 2007, which also shows that under some contexts, more uh, information can be, uh, can be revealed under multi-dimensional context than under single-dimensional context. But uh, these are papers which focus on uh, this crawford sobel framework. And what I'm going to be looking at is, is a framework that people uh, tend to use to think about international politics, which is a bit different, has both sides taking actions that affect each other's payoffs and, and uncertainty both sides of things. So the model that I'm going to be looking at is really very, very simple, and as I say, really very similar to other things that are out through the, to the kind of simple model. When people want to say, this is our simple model of a crisis bargaining situation, they use a model like this. There's just one, effectively one, uh, twist that I have here. So uh, first, there's going to be a country that's called the Turk has to decide uh, if it's going to make some threats that are costless entirely costless, it gets to send it, uh, some messages uh, to the target. And then the target, uh, ha having observed that, decides is it going to make concessions on uh, two issues. Okay, so either it can concede both, one, the other, or neither. And then the deter, based on what the target has done, has to decide is it actually going to go to war or is it not going to go to war. So there are two states indexed by I, subscripted with Ds and Ts. There are two issues uh, indexed by Z. There's a most preferred payoff for both the players, which is this, um, this GI here. That's the peace payoff. That's their most preferred peace outcome. There's a war payoff, which isn't going to change no matter what happens uh, at this point in the game over here. The, uh, the war payoff for the player isn't going to change. We could think about what would happen if we relax that assumption. Uh, there's a value to each of the issues, which is going to be private information of each side. Okay? And uh, we're going to say, as I think I say down here, that um, each of the issues can take on either a high value or a low value. Okay? So for each player, for each of the issues, a high value or a low value. So uh, if, uh, the, uh, if uh, player I doesn't get what it wants on the first issue, it gets its most preferred piece playoff, minus whatever its value is for the first issue. And similarly, if it doesn't get both issues, then that's the, that's the outcome. 
So it's impossible for them, for them both to get TI. Uh, correct. It's, it's impossible for them both to get their most preferred outcome. Okay. Um, so probability of the, uh, the issue, that each of the issues, uh, that each of uh, the players for each of the issues uh, has a low value for that issue is just going to be uh, that thing there. And we make the assumption in the case of the deter, remember the deter, you might just replace signaler if you prefer in your mind, that's the player that's moving first. Uh, we make this assumption about their payoffs, namely uh, that if they're a high type on either one of the issues, they like that less than war. So if they don't get one of the issues that's important to them, they'd rather go to war. And if they don't get both of the issues, but they're not a high type on either one of the issues, then they'd rather not go to war. OK, I think I've, uh, I've mostly uh, described this at this point. <coughs> you can see how the payoffs work out uh, down below uh, exactly as described. So the first thing I want to do is just give you a, an example where I think we can see why uh, how the uh, two-dimensional uh, twist on this uh, very standard model makes a big, big difference. Uh, so the properties of this example, if the deter, the signaler, says that one of the issues is, is important and the other issue is not important, it's more likely to get uh, what it asked for than, uh, than it was uh, before it asked. And if the deter says that both of the issues are important, that is, it makes a demand on both dimensions, it is more likely to get its way on both uh, than it was before it demanded both, uh, would have been if it had said anything else, and would have been in the absence of a communication mechanism. Uh, so that was actually a little bit surprising to me. When I first started doing this model, I thought, well, you know, I think states are doing this. I think they. They say, hey, this is important to me, and the fact that they didn't demand the, the other thing, that ought to convey some information. It was a little bit surprising to me before I started to think about it, that actually, even when they say, hey, both of these things are important to me, that, uh, that they can cause uh, information to be conveyed and, and affect actions. OK, in this example, uh, we're going to say that the most preferred piece payoffs of the players are 50. The war payoffs of both players are 20. The low value uh, for both of the players, if they don't care too much about the issue, is a 5. High value for the deter is a 35. And the high value for the target is a 15. The probability that each of them is a low type on each of the issues, 40%. Okay. So this implies that the high type of deters will fight for an issue, the low type not. On the other hand, the target always prefers a settlement to war in this example. Okay. So, uh, and the, the signaling strategy is going to be like this. The, uh, the types that of deter that are low on both issues are going to, and the types that are high on both issues, they're going to pool and send the same message. But the types that, are, uh, that prefer one to two, they're going to say, hey, I prefer one to two, or they're going to send a unique message. And similarly, the types that, prefer that say, hey, two is important, one's not so important, they're going to send also a unique so that's uh, what we say here is exactly what I just said. What's the target's optimum response? Uh, when only one issue is demanded, the target would rather not fight. It doesn't have to. Uh, it will just concede that. When both issues are demanded, uh, the target knows it's uh, useless to concede only one, right? Because the low, low and the high, high were pooling. Uh, so the target knows there's no point in conceding just one. Uh, so if, it's a, if the target is a high type on both issues, it's going to concede neither one. Uh, and otherwise, it's going to make a concession on both, which, uh, based on what we said about our assumed initial probabilities, means that the target concedes 64% uh, of the time. All right. Uh, so just very quickly, uh, we can see that things are uh, that the target's beliefs are being affected here. Initially, the target's initial evaluation is that the deter is 60% likely to fight for the first issue. After the settlement, uh, the statement that uh, the uh, deter would fight for the first but not for the second, the uh, target knows 100% the deter will fight for the first issue. Uh, the target's uh, initial 
evaluation is that the juror is 36% likely to fight for both uh, after the statement uh, that increases to 69%. That is, if, if both are demanded, then uh, almost doubles the probability, the target's evaluation of likelihood that the signaler will fight for both issues. This, uh, because beliefs are updated, actions are also uh, affected. Target's actions are also affected. So the initial likelihood that the target would make a concession on both is 33%. Uh, after the juror says it would fight for both, the likelihood rises to 64%. In the absence, so that's in an equilibrium, in, a particular, in this particular equilibrium that we're going to look at. But in the absence of a communication mechanism, when there isn't a, when we don't look at uh, the informative uh, cheap talk equilibrium, there's only a 16% chance that the target makes a concession on both issues. So communication is having a big effect. All right. How can this be an equilibrium? Uh, deters uh, that are willing to fight for both, uh, say they're willing to fight for both, and those that aren't willing to fight uh, for either, or for whom neither is important, I should say, have low, low type on both. Uh, they say that they'll fight for both. So that seems natural, and that's sort of the way that the literature tends to think about costless signaling. But why would deters that are only willing to fight for one issue actually admit that, right? Because even if they're not, even if they're uh, not willing to fight for an issue, or even if they're uh, a low type on an issue, they still want it, right? They still prefer it. So why are they admit, willing to admit that uh, it's okay, I don't, I don't need that? So to see why this optimal, we can do, uh, do very simple algebra here. Uh, we can say, um, well, if a, if a, if a juror says, hey, this is important to me, and this isn't, and knows for sure the target's going to concede the one that's important. <coughs> so its payoff, given the numbers that we used, was, would be 45, this thing there. On the other hand, so that's its equilibrium payoff. On the other hand, suppose it were to deviate. If it were to deviate, say both issues are important, well, it has a 64% chance of getting its way on both issues but it has a 36% chance also of, it, of getting its way on neither of the issues. So its equilibrium path would just be 39.2, and so it doesn't want to deviate. So it's very, very simple. Uh, in effect, the deter can say, this issue is important to me, and, there, and get it. So if it doesn't say that, and it demands everything, then it risks not getting what is really important to it, and possibly having to fight a war, all for the sake of what's not particularly important. Okay. Uh, so first proposition, which I am not putting up, uh, just says, uh, and I've, uh, the paper makes a, a big attempt to speak to many audiences, and so there are formally stated propositions in the appendix, and there are more loosely stated propositions uh, in the paper, which are the ones I'm going to put up. Uh, but you can obviously look, look at the paper. So the first proposition says that there is not an equilibrium in which uh, all the information is revealed. It's hard to convince the type that's low in both dimensions to say that it is because you wouldn't get anything. So that uh, you might admit. So it's not that we can ever in this, uh, in this model get perfect revelation of the information. Uh, but we can get quite a bit, as we saw in the example. So now I'm going to make an assumption which is contrary to uh, the, the um, example that we looked at. We're going to assume that targets that are a high type on one of the issues would prefer to fight a war than not fight a war. Now, as I say, that wasn't true in the example, isn't true in order to get the result, but we're going to make that assumption uh, for, uh, for the following results. All right. Proposition two says that uh, if we make that assumption, if the probability that the two players uh, are uh, not resolved over the two issues is low enough, okay, uh, or probably they are resolved, is high enough, then a unique maximally informative equilibrium uh, exists. So, uh, and not only does it exist, it looks like this. So on this dimension over here, we have the probability that the, um, 
the target is uh, low resolve with respect to issue one, and here the same thing, target probability of low resolve with respect to issue two. And uh, you can see when we say that uh, they have to, we're in this range, we're, uh, we're down here at the box uh, that uh, borders on zero, zero over there. Okay? So we're not looking at the parameter range up here where it's more likely that the target is low resolve with respect to the two issues. So this is uh, what the deters signaling strategy looks like in this range. Uh, so let's see, if the, um, if the target is more likely to be low resolved on issue two than on issue one, and which is true in this range, uh, and if we are in fact in that range, uh, then the, um, the, ty the um, types for whom only two is important, they say only two is important. And the types that uh, for whom neither of the two issues are important, it's not going to fight for either, it pools with that type. Okay? So they, in effect, uh, because um, they know that they're more likely to get a concession on that issue, that's the one they go for, right? as you might imagine. On the other hand, uh, this, uh, when the um, target sees that issue one is important and not issue two, that is, uh, when the demand is for the issue that's relative, that's uh, less likely to be forthcoming, then the target knows for sure that that demand is credible. And uh, also, and perhaps surprisingly, when the deter makes a demand on both dimensions, that is, says both are important, the target knows for sure that that's true. Right? And symmetrically, uh, over here, over here, uh, this is a, effectively the case that we saw in the example, even though the assumption is slightly different. The, the low, low types are pooling with the high, high types. So when the target sees that uh, sees a, only two is important or only one is important, those are the cases when it knows for sure that that's true. Right. Proposition three, so under the same assumption uh, and the same condition, probabilities that the turn and target are not resolved over the issues are low enough. Uh, an equilibrium exists in which uh, for any demand that the deter makes, the target is more likely to take the action demanded by the deter than it was prior to the demand, which you can see follows fairly quickly from uh, what we just saw. All right, uh, proposition four uh, says that, uh, that the, um, the level of precision of a signal outside of this range over here, this is what we were looking at before. That was the range from the previous fig figure with uh, regions uh, one, two, and three. Uh, so if we're outside of that, and we're in this range over here, then signaling can't be as precise. That is, at most two signals are sent in equilibrium. Uh, and, um, and that's gonna have some effects. We actually, we can say for sure that it won't be as precise it's much harder to say exactly uh, what the um, what this different uh, deter strategies are going to be over over different signaling ranges because the ranges can overlap. So it's harder to say exactly what signaling looks like out there, but we know for sure that it's less precise, and that has uh, has an interesting implication. So, uh, as I said to you before, um, we, this, uh, this over here is the probability that the target is a low type with respect to one of the issues, holding everything else in the model phase. And uh, this uh, is, on this axis we have probability of conflict. So this red line over here is the case without communication. Without communication, uh, as you would imagine, uh, as the, it becomes less likely that the target's going to fight for something, the probability of war decreases. But uh, with communication, things are a little bit different. The first thing you notice is uh, that the, um, this line is also decreasing over this range. It's decreasing, of course, much more quickly than this line is decreasing. So communication has this effect uh, that, uh, that uh, it uh, drastically uh, reduces the um, likelihood of war when the target is, uh, is uh, less resolved over, likely to be less resolved over uh, one of the issues. It has, a, in other words, a larger effect when the probability that the target is less resolved is greater. But over here, where we switch and we sort of go outside of this part of the figure, 
where I said we were uh, in the range where signaling was at its most precise, when we go outside of that range, uh, which was what happens here, then the probability of war jumps up. So we get this sort of non monotonic <coughs> effect, which is sort of interesting. So as it becomes uh, less likely that the target is willing to fight, it becomes more likely that we see war. And why? Because communication is less precise, and the probability of war is closer to the probability of war in the absence of a communication mechanism. All right, so uh, that was most of what I wanted to tell you, actually. Now I just have two examples to talk about. Uh, I, uh, I like to, uh, to come up with examples for what I do, so uh, these, are, these are ones I think are interesting, uh, but uh, I'd be happy to talk, uh, talk to you about. Uh, anyway, um, Berlin. Uh, Kennedy actually says Khrushchev, we are not now talking about Laos when they meet in Berlin, June, uh, in um, Vienna in June of 1961. We're not now talking about Laos. And there are a lot of issues, obviously, before the two sides. And Kennedy chooses to focus on one. And he shows himself willing to make concessions on all the other issues, uh, but not on Berlin and the status of Berlin. And unfortunately, Khrushchev does the same thing, and so the sides can't agree. And Famously, at the end of the meeting, Kennedy says, well, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I think it's going to be a cold winter. Uh, and Kennedy goes off and um, makes plans for, uh, he tells his generals that developments in Berlin uh, might lead to the possibility of uh, the US wanting to make a first strike uh, over, over, uh, over uh, this issue. Um, not that that would be the policy, just that that was an, uh, contingency considered, and anyway, Khrushchev goes off and reacts also in, uh, in a very negative way and, and takes uh, policies that are significantly different as a result. Uh, but what's interesting to me is that we see Kennedy making this explicit, and Khrushchev also making this explicit, that what they really care about is one of the issues and all these other things, which are important at the time, very, very important. I mean, Laos at the time is sort of the precursor to Vietnam, and the sides were thinking, is this going to be where the, uh, the superpower conflict is, uh, is felt in the third world. Uh, and there's a time when it looks like it might be, which is this time. Uh, but nevertheless, the two sides are willing to say, this isn't the issue. Berlin is the issue. So they're making a concession there. And I think things can be learned from the fact that they're saying that. Uh, 1973, in the Middle East War, the, uh, the Egyptian army is uh, surrounded. There's a ceasefire that's signed through the UN. And then the Egyptian army is surrounded, in effect, the third army, uh, by the Israeli army and is being kind of uh, starved. Um, and the Soviets become very upset by this because the Egyptians are uh, more a client of the Soviets. Uh, than of the Western side. And so the Soviets make a proposal to the US. They say, well, let's both go in to this region with our troops and stabilize things and ensure that the provisions of the ceasefire <coughs> will actually be carried out. Uh, but they say, but that's, uh, that's one thing. You know, we want you to do this with us. But if you don't, we're going in unilaterally. So arguably, there are two issues uh, being negotiated <coughs> on here. As well, one is whether uh, there will be joint action between the two superpowers, and the other is whether the Soviet Union is going to go in unilaterally, and what the U.S. response to that will be. So Kissinger's response, through a very sharply uh, worded letter uh, from Nixon, <coughs> the very middle of Watergate, of course, uh, is no and no. So I think arguably this is a case where uh, the um, type of equilibrium where uh, one player says no on both issues uh, actually makes sense. Because if the US uh, had thought that this unilateral thing was you know, something it really wanted to avoid, but it could actually live with something like joint action uh, with the US, then it could have gone for that. It had that opportunity. And the fact that it said no on both uh, may have actually really signaled something to the Soviets about US commitment on both, to, 
Okay, to summarize, signaling on one dimension is uninformative. Signaling on two or more uh, can be informative. Sometimes uh, we can, in fact, have communication with certainty <coughs> in the sense that the side that is, uh, that, is uh, that receives the signal knows for sure under what conditions the other side will and will not go to war. Uh, and even insisting on both issues can be informative, which was a little bit surprising to me. Uh, okay, uh, single, a single, if it's just a single issue, you know, I said, I think at the beginning, and hopefully I've convinced you that even if a single issue is being negotiated over, that may be just one side insisting on only Berlin. So we usually think of the Berlin crises as about Berlin. But the fact that there are these other issues in the background that states aren't emphasizing uh, may be the, an endogenous uh, result of the strategic dynamic. And if so, it may be that even though there's one issue that seems very prominent, nevertheless, communication is possible. Finally, I, I told you about the nonlinear comparative static. Higher probability the target is willing to back down over one issue may, not always will, but may lead to a higher probability of war. And that is a slide I didn't want to show you. So thank you very much. <laughs> In the examples, how do you make the assessment that uh, the partic each particular case, how do you sort of uh, classify it and uh, what kind of criteria are you using? And in those cases, it might be helpful to have other political scientists or historians actually uh, make sort of uh, their own assessments and you try to integrate them somehow. I mean, it's sort of, it, this is not a, a simple issue. You don't trust me? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's a, uh, there are different op differences of opinion about, obviously, in those cases, which, yes, which yes. Uh, sort of case it falls off. And a rather different question than uh, how do you determine whether there are two issues or three or five or seven? And how do you aggregate them? Here you have uh, uh, actually, they, they are actually separable because you have separable payoffs. But in many cases, in many interesting cases, the yes. two can be actually, can be complements or substitutes. In your case, they are substitutes, but they can be complementarities between different issues. And that would, uh, uh, you know, would uh, it opens up all these different possibilities. It's not a criticism. It's just yeah. about uh, opening up the possibilities. No, I, I entirely agree with everything that you said. And believe me, if some historians were willing to go and look at this and code cases uh, based on uh, my criterion, I would be more than happy to have them do it, but none have offered uh, <laughs> as yet. Um, I guess I, I think that uh, it's not enough just to go and look. It's not nearly enough to go and look at histories that have been written, because, of course, uh, historians, like anybody else, comes to, come to data and look for particular things. And so if they're not looking for something, often they don't find it. Uh, and not only that, but in the, as a result of various 20th century historiographic movements, uh, they don't really do diplomatic history anymore. <laughs> so uh, they do something called international history sometimes these days. But uh, it tends also not to focus on the uh, elite level of interaction Which is, which is what I'm interested in here, uh, and unapologetically so. Uh, so, um, so uh, yes, I agree with you, I think, but, I, but I do think that, um, that cases can, these cases can be debated, and I think, it's, uh, I think that's very interesting. I'm, I'm very interested if anybody has a particular take on, on them. Uh, I, think, <laughs> I think we may have yeah, one. Yeah, I do, because can you go back to the slide on the 73 award? Sure. So what happens is it's true that Kissinger says no one no, but then he goes around and coerces the Israelis to do exactly what the Soviets are um, uh, threatening to do, and then uh, and that's the end of the the uh, uh, surrounding of the Third Army that basically ends the the, 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 the major strategic uh, achievement of the seventy three war on the side of the Israelis. So basically the Soviets do get their way. Uh, but how did even the Soviet... though Kissinger, in the strategic bargaining context, says no, no. Yeah. 
uses that yeah. information to basically coerce an outcome. Oh yeah, he coerces the, ground, the Israelis exactly to, to not starve out the Third Army. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. well, that's true. That's true. But nevertheless, uh, I mean, he he manages to do that, but the uh, the Soviets don't do what they were threatening to do either. So, I mean, they do don't send. So well, eventually they don't need to, but they don't know initially that they don't need to. So then, then it becomes clear that the U.S. is successful at coercing the Israelis, but initially they don't do the things on the time frame that they said they were going to do. Well, they did postpone nuclear weapons. Yeah. It was very, yeah, it was a dangerous confrontation because yeah. of this no It was behind the scenes, publicly speaking, yeah. this, the Americans refused and we went on alert to deter the Soviets who were publicly saying that they would go in. So, yeah, behind the scenes they... And it all was happening in the middle of water. So. This brings up an issue. I mean, a lot of times a third alternative is sort of endogenous to the degree of inefficiency that's arising from this. So in that case, for instance, I mean, they basically forced Sharon to go back, back over the canal. And I mean, it's clear there was sort of a, a wide range of potential options that could be employed there. And it was sort of this degree, it seems to me that in that case, it was this degree of potential inefficiency of, of the proposals that, that existed that created these new proposals to try to drive that wedge and sort all of these, these uh, types out. And so that, that seems to be, you know, one thing, one interesting aspect of this is when, you know, when are there these third issues that can be used to wedge to, to determine these types and when, and when are there not those issues? Yeah, um, I have one more thing to say in answer to, uh, to your question, but uh, maybe I'll take Barry's too because uh, I have a feeling that the answer to Barry's will be the same. <laughs> <laughs> I could be wrong. How could you possibly know? I just know. How could you possibly know? <laughs> Well, maybe change the question to that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll never know. <laughs> that, that, you know, you know, you may know if you are, if you know if you know what I'm going to ask. You know that it's that uh, it's a, to me it's an issue. What's an issue? Okay, and and you have this yes, idea. That's that, what I thought you were going to ask. <laughs> you have the idea that it's got to do with separability. And sure enough, in the model, uh, things are separable. There's yeah. e one plus e two for me, and so on. But, but when you come to describe it empirically, it couldn't be that way. For example, yeah. uh, should the Soviets go in unilaterally it, or should we go in with the US? I mean, there's no way to add those two together because they can't occur jointly. Yeah. And um, you know, the other element in the model was that the two issues have to show independence in the other side's yeah. viewpoint. That is, I, I, I don't know, I have no, you know, information on what, whether you, this, this is higher low for you, gives me nothing yeah. about whether that's higher low for you. And so I'm going to criticize the first example you have of the Cuban Missile Crisis, where uh, you know I can possibly believe that Khrushchev's dedication to Cuba not being invaded is separate from his dedication to keeping the missiles in. But the idea of keeping the missiles in Cuba, being independent of keeping the missiles in Turkey, or getting rid of the missiles in Turkey, in both of these speak to the same issue, where the strategic balance is. Yeah. And so are those three issues or two issues? And so and so. You know, maybe the title of this should be, uh, I mean, it's not so much are there two issues, mm -hmm. it's it's the degree of perceived independence of the two issues. I mean, this the degree of independence is a matter of degree. Issues sounds like there's either several dimensions or not, but yeah. but it's, no, it's, I, it's, it, it seems like you're- I haven't heard well. anything that I disagree with yet. Okay, well, uh, I'll try. The, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, I think that that, that uh, certainly, one of the most sensible ways of extending the model would be to allow for correlation between the issues. And I think that that would interfere with signaling. I think this is probably the extreme case. Because uh, I think that's the main reason why some other models find, uh, well, I mean, I think, for instance, Morrow's model, where if you have uncertainty that's mostly about whether or not you'll go to war, so there you have perfect <coughs> correlation between the sources of uncertainty across dimensions. Because the only uncertainty is whether you'll go to war, so it's the same in one dimension or the other, in a sense. So well, just, just briefly, to, to clarify what I, was, what I was trying to say, is that, that I, I don't, I'm not saying you ought to extend it, because that just makes oh, it more complicated. <laughs> but I just think that uh, it's always our, our, our task to figure out what we said yeah. for other people and even for ourselves sometimes. 
and, and so what is this what is this model talking about? Is it talking about multidimensionality? I don't think it is. It's talking about something else. Well, uh, that's possible. You always want to fight with me about the words I use to describe whatever it is. But yeah. What it is is what it is. You, know? <laughs> you want to think it, about it as something different, that's fine with me. But, but I, in terms of your point about, um, and your point also, about, uh, about real world examples, I, I really take this, I really agree with you that, that uh, in many of these cases there's no question, there's some correlation, there's some information that you get about whether or not uh, you know, one issue uh, is important if the other one is important and vice versa. And there's something about willingness to go to war, which is common in both cases. Uh, and uh, so I think, yes, it's true that uh, the way that really uh, separate issues are defined in the paper is whether or not uh, they're drawn from independent distributions or something that approximates an independent distribution uh, such that we would get uh, dynamics uh, close to the ones that are described in the proposition. But I, I agree with you that, uh, that that's not exactly the way the world looks uh, in many of the cases that we are interested in. So I, I think that, an I hope that answers your question about how to think about what constitutes uh, one issue versus a separate issue. Uh, but uh, I, you know, I've only done this, so that's what I can tell you. Yeah. Well, this, however, now makes the second case study extremely problematic because you really, it's a one dimension, it's just the extent of concessions you, that the United States is supposed to make. The issue is, yeah. basically you can interpret the Soviet demand, but if uh, either we go in, I know you know, you directly, <coughs> we, we will save the Egyptians. And yeah. the question is publicly, are you gonna be humiliated by staying out, are you gonna come in with us and pretend to be part of this? So it's really just one issue. And it's the extent of American concessions, and Kissinger saying no and no. He's not saying no in two different dimensions, just saying, I'm just not, we don't agree to this. It's a question of degree. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that that's true, but I think, um, well, I think a similar logic can still operate, basically. Um, I, you know, one could do more, more work to find out for sure if that's true, but I'm pretty sure that a similar logic would still operate. Yeah. If I can go away, important is that as some of these technicalities are, that is to say how you specify the issues, whether they're additive, whether they're correlated, it seems to me that there's a much more fundamental problem, which is the kind of problem that Tao was raising, which is are we even talking about the right game? I mean, the characteristic of, uh, I remember reading a long, long ago, Crawford and Sobel, and saying to myself, cheap talk, hmm, what a marvelous concept, and how almost irrelevant to anything in the real world uh, is cheap talk. Because any time you talk, it has consequences because you are, in fact, sending signals not just to the person with whom you're immediately communicating, but you're sending signals to a domestic audience. And of course, in the current comparative politics IR literature, there's much more emphasis on looking at, uh, if you will, two-level games where you're looking both at the, the, the effects of communication on the international audience that you're directly addressing plus communication in the internal audience. So when you see Kissinger saying no and no, for example, you're seeing Kissinger at least perhaps in part playing to a domestic audience as well as expressing resolve in another game, the Cold War game, which is a distinct, uh, a much bigger game than the immediate uh, question of what's going to happen with the Egyptian army. Um, and you also then can't use the model you have to sort of correctly interpret the signal that Kissinger is sending, because if we know the facts, we know that at the same time Kissinger was sending this signal, he was actually talking to the Israelis and getting them to let the Egyptian army go free. So, you know, the question of what's actually going on here and how we properly specify the game to understand <coughs> the impact of particular communications or whether we can read those as sincere communications, informative communications, is I think a lot more complicated. And I think that the cheap talk framework. I, you better let me answer stuff. at some point because yeah, uh, yeah, no, no. I, now you've at least, <laughs> there are three different things that have been raised. <laughs> uh, I'm going to start forgetting. Um, well, I mean, I guess, okay, the, the, uh, I, I can only give you some easy answers, uh, but I think they're nevertheless correct to some of the things that you said. Um, 
you know, when you, you're never going to get a model that, that perfectly captures the world. If it's your standard, you know, at the, off the bat, reject everything. I mean, don't even read a paper, you know, just reject. Uh, so uh, I think there's an argument to be made for a simpler model because it's easier to, number one, figure out what's going on there. And number two, gives you a sense of, uh, gives you an intuition uh, for dynamics, which you know may be a little bit portable, and then you can ask yourself when you apply it to particular cases if it really makes sense, or if in this case there's something going on that means that it that it doesn't. Now, I agree with you about Kissinger, but in my mind, I still think that there's something that's essentially similar in that case to the dynamics described in the model, even though for the reasons uh, two very important reasons that have been pointed out, it doesn't perfectly fit the model. Uh, so, you know, that's, no, if it's way, if it's so far off, then I shouldn't be using that case, and that's fair enough. But I haven't heard anything that makes me think that it's that far off. So I, because when I look at it, I still see the, the essential logic of being the same for how, how signals convey information. Now, whether cheap talk, you know, matters or not, well, um, <coughs> That raises a couple of issues. One of the ones that you raise is uh, is whether uh, there's signaling to a domestic audience, and this is our bread and butter in, in the international relations field. You know, lots of literature on signaling to a domestic audience, and so part of the motivation for this paper is to figure out well, if it's not just signaling to a domestic audience, how does it then convey information to a foreign state? And and uh, contrary to what you said, lots of signaling goes on behind closed doors, so it isn't signaling to a domestic audience, at least not immediately. I mean, I know what happened uh, in Vienna in June of 1961 because I've read the Foreign Relations of the United States, which was published 30 years later because of the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, but at the time, people didn't know exactly what was said by leaders, so often it isn't signaling to a domestic audience, and then how does that work? But to, your, to the other half of your point that, well, maybe it's a larger game, and there's sort of uh, there's also a decision to be made about whether to signal to a domestic audience uh, or not, and that should, should and so this game should be embedded in that game. I think that's right, but again, I fall back on my first point. That, well, and I also fall back on saying, well, this is what I've done. So, <laughs> uh, so that's a of cheap talk. I mean, I think this is an unfair criticism. When they, when they talk about cheap talk, there's a specific meaning here. It's that it, it sell the messages do not have any costs. Not that they do not have any effects. In fact, that's what we're studying. Yeah. What kind of consequences you they will have? So, um, in that sense, words themselves, you don't. I mean, you breathe, I guess, so that's some cost of they're using half oxygen, but they're costless, and that's what you're studying. It is not that they don't have consequences. And this get there's a I think Barry and I were talking on the, on the drive down. There's some confusion in the literature about how to use these terms, and, and yeah. but but so when I think when I think well, when Crawford Sobel were using these terms, they were using it in the sense that Bronislav is describing, uh, just that you, you say whatever you want to say, but then after that, the game that goes on, the strategic interaction, is absolutely unchanged. Which does seem, to my mind at least, to be a reasonable way to start to get at talking. Because our, whether we go to war or not, is our payoffs for it may be unchanged based on that. It was, yeah. yeah. I was just going to say, I mean, doesn't actually, your model actually fit the, actually, going back to the tells question, um, it actually seems to fit quite well if the second issue is what happens to the Third Army. Um, there's two, there are two yeah. issues, what happens to the Third Army and whether the Soviet Union actually gets a military foothold in Egypt. These are separable. Kissinger sends them, it doesn't send a message no and no, he actually sends the message no. And behind the scenes, things change. So it actually, I, I, I wonder if your model doesn't actually fit. I mean, taking the point that actually whether there's US involvement is really along the same dimension. It seems to fit. It seems to actually fit quite well, or better, better than your your portraying this fitting. I think. Hmm. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I think it's a it's a reasonable interpretation of what was going on. I I just feel guilty about adopting it so quickly. <laughs> Maybe I will tomorrow. <laughs> okay, so we're we're um, running out of time, so I'm going to have a break now. <laughs> no, not finally, but we're going to have a break. And I guess we'll pick up again at 3.30, is that, is that yeah. So 3.30, thank you.